Hello and good afternoon from the DEA Museum. I'm Jan Rosinski, the museum's director. Today we're presenting the first of a series of programs to spotlight DEA's 50th anniversary year. There's a lot to reflect upon, the operations, successes, challenges, and milestones of DEA. At the heart of our reflection this year is the effort and success of individuals, both at DEA and across the globe, as we work together. This program is about our 50 years of partnerships and collaborations, and in a moment, you'll meet our panelists. The DEA Museum collects, preserves, and shares the history of DEA, its predecessor agencies, law enforcement, and the work of our employees. A good portion of the museum informs our visitors about drug history and properties, manufacturing and trafficking, drug use and misuse, addiction, and so much more. State-of-the-art interactive exhibits are deeply educational for all ages. We say the museum is a blend of history, science, and culture, and is unique in America. I invite you to visit in person and online. And as we move forward, the museum will continue to present programs to celebrate and acknowledge the work of DEA and our partners around the world. Look forward to new exhibits and an anniversary book on our 50 years. Go to deamuseum.org to keep abreast of what's new, sign up for the museum's newsletter, and learn about the museum's partners in drug prevention and education. And now let's get to it. Our moderator today is Curator of Education, Josh Edmondson. We are so excited about this first DEA Museum Presents program celebrating DEA's 50th anniversary. Joining us today are three of DEA's finest, George Papadopoulos, Deputy Chief of Operations, Office of Foreign Operations, Sean Ferns, Chief of Community Outreach, Office of Public Affairs, and Jennifer Sweeter, Group Supervisor, Washington Division Office. George, Jen, and Sean have decades of collaborative experience and many enlightening stories to share with us about DEA's long tradition of partnerships and collaboration. Sean, Jen, George, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, why don't we begin by uh, discussing or telling us a little bit about your careers with DEA. Jen, would you like to start? Sure. Thanks, Josh. Uh, my name is Jen Sweeter. I've been with DEA as a special agent for 17 years now. Um, I, I spent my first six years at the Los Angeles Field Division. Then I transferred to the International Training Unit at Quantico, Virginia, where I taught in over 20 countries. I studied Russian before moving to Moscow, Russia in 2016, and I spent two years there before I promoted to country attache of the Tbilisi country office in Georgia. And eight months ago, I returned back stateside and I'm running a task force as a group supervisor up in Greenbelt, Maryland, and I'm really happy to be here today. We're glad you're back too. Thanks. Thank you. Sean, how about you? Sure, Josh, thanks. And uh, thank you to the museum uh, for having us here today. Uh, so I, I've been at DEA, it'll be just about 25 years. Uh, all of my time has been here in the Office of Public Affairs, which has also included some congressional affairs work. In the past, I'm on the civilian side. Uh, my background is in communications and, and business. Uh, and so I started, actually the very first project I worked on that first summer I started was DEA's 25th anniversary. So here we are 25 years later celebrating DEA's 50th. Um, and then soon thereafter, uh, the idea for a DEA museum uh, germinated. And uh, I was brought in as the first director of the DEA museum from about 2000 to about 2015. Um, and then for the last seven years, uh, I've been running our shop that focuses on uh, supporting work out in the community to reduce the demand for drugs. Uh, we call it our Office of Community Outreach and Prevention Support. Well, thank you. Sure. Thank you for the 25 years. Yeah. And how about you, George? Great. Yes, thanks again uh, for the opportunity to be here. I was hired in Chicago in 1996. Um, and my first assignment after the academy was Detroit, where I stayed until 2004. Um, at two th in August of 2004, I was uh, lucky enough to get selected for the Athens, Greece country office. Um, and I got promoted in place there in 2007 to the country attache. Um, in 2010, I returned to special operations division 
Uh, mm -hmm. And I was a group supervisor in what was then called the 959 group, what's now called the BIU, Bilateral Investigations Unit. Um, and I stayed there until August 2013 when I transferred upstairs to a staff coordinator position within special operations. Um, and then uh, after about a uh, few months of that, I was uh, lucky enough to get selected to come to headquarters as the executive assistant to the deputy chief of operations. I stayed for uh, about a year and a half here and then back to SOD as the assistant special agent in charge of the bilateral investigations unit, um, where I stayed for about six years and then returned here in January of 2022 as the deputy chief of operations for the Office of Foreign Operations, where I have oversight over all of DEA's foreign offices. Wow, that's really incredible. You all have such a diverse uh, background and you've been all over the place in your careers. Except for Sean, because you've been, <laughs> you've, been here stewarding, yeah. but you've been stewarding the museum, <laughs> right. the community outreach. So thank you all. Uh, Jen, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your time in Russia? How did collaborations work there? So people are often surprised when I say that I really enjoyed my time in Russia but it certainly did not come without some challenges, not least of which was being the first female agent in Russia. And we'd been open about 20 years at that time. Also, the embassy and our office there were cut uh, over two thirds um, due to political reasons. But despite these and several other challenges, um, and as George well knows, DEA is often in a unique position overseas to operate outside of politics and work towards mutual goals. In fact, our office was one of, if not the only at the embassy to regularly meet with Russia's Federal Security Service, the FSB, and their Ministry of Internal Affairs, the MBD. Because we typically have very little police powers overseas and none in the case of Russia, we rely heavily on our law enforcement partners to conduct operations and move cases forward. Russia has over a million police officers, so assistance in Russia was different than in most places we operate. But we had some really excellent joint successes. We expelled two Russian cocaine traffickers from the Dominican Republic. We conducted controlled deliveries of steroids from Russia to the United States. And we also initiated first-time cooperation with Belarus. Uh, so even in a contentious part of the world, we can really find some common ground when it comes to combating drug trafficking. Wow, that's really fascinating. And the first woman officer over there, I'm yeah. sorry, agent. Yes. That's amazing, and after 20 years. Yeah, it's uh, about time. Yeah, <laughs> right? Uh, George, can you speak about the partnerships you experienced in Romania? Sure. Um, so when I was in Athens, we were lucky enough to cover Romania. We had, uh, at the time, we had four countries that we covered from Greece. Uh, in addition to Greece, Romania, Bulgaria, and northern, what's northern Macedonia now. Um, and I will tell you that in Romania, we developed an outstanding working relationship with the counterparts, um, primarily with the uh, Romanian border police, and then it got folded into the Romanian national police. Um, so these are hardworking counterparts with uh, limited resources, but they were always willing to help us uh, with all of our uh, investigations and cases. Uh, we joked that we never uh, knew what the Romanian word for no was because they never said it to us. Um, so uh, we did so many operations uh, around the middle of the 2000s in Romania that we were actually getting concerned that the bad guys would figure out that the police were involved if, we, if they were ever invited to travel to <laughs> Romania. Um, so we started looking for other places, but the Romanians were great. Um, and the incredible support uh, that they provided us eventually led to the opening of the Bucharest country office. Wow, so. wow, that's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Sean, can you tell us what do DEA's National Public Preventative Outreach in Initiatives look like? And please tell us what we're seeing in this image. Sure. So uh, the slide that you're sharing with the audience uh, is uh, a graphic that represents all of the pieces of a local community that need to come together to address a drug problem in a particular community, either to address the risk factors that lead to the drug problem establishing there in the first place, or to address the protective factors that help to deal with uh, protecting kids and parents and others from the issue. And if you notice over there in the top right corner of that graphic is law enforcement. So, you know, the uh, DEA's involvement in this space goes all the way back to the mid 1980s. So not long after DEA is created, 
in July of 1973. And at that time, there's a DEA special agent, Enrique Camarena, who is kidnapped, tortured, and murdered in Mexico uh, because he was a DEA agent. And the leadership of DEA at the time said, you know what, we have got to enlist the help of every American to be part of the solution. That while we at DEA continue to go after the drug trafficking organizations, that we need to enlist the help of every American. And one way you do that is through a graphic like this, where you bring together civic organizations, faith-based organizations, the media, schools, parents, teachers. Um, you know, there are some places where having law enforcement be the lead in bringing these groups to sit around the table makes a difference. There are other times when a faith-based organization is best equipped to be the one to convene the group and to address the situation. So while uh, it might differ from city to city to city what exact role the DEA plays, uh, there's no doubt that both the information that we have to help inform prevention strategies in terms of the drug intelligence that we know of, uh, com com combined with our ability to bring folks to the table, uh, gives a community the best chance for success. And you know we can never do it alone. No one graphic, uh, no one circle on this graphic, I should say, would be able to address the drug problem by themselves. So DEA is but one seat at the table. That's great. Thank you so much. Sure. George, as is always the case with DEA, partnerships helped bring down another notorious uh, um, arms dealer, uh, Monzer al Kassar. Uh, can you tell us about that mission and what's going on in this photo with the mansion? Sure. So uh, Monzer al Kassar was uh, involved in uh, drug and weapons trafficking basically for his whole life. Uh, he had declared the U.S. his enemy. Um, and was considered untouchable. Um, so he, one of the things he also did was back in 1985, the Achille Lauro was a cruise ship that was hijacked. Um, he provided the weapons to the hijackers for that. Um, and during that hijacking, um, a the American citizen who was in a wheelchair named Leon Klinghoffer was killed and thrown overboard. Um, so in... Um, uh, the, the SOD 959 group at the time uh, targeted him and was able to infiltrate his inner circle. And the, the, the graphic that you're showing is uh, him being Mr. Untouchable around with his uh, um, staff at his house in Spain. Um, and so within a few months, uh, we had sources that were able to infiltrate his inner circle, have direct negotiations with him about supplying weapons uh, to the FARC that would be used to kill Americans in Colombia. He did not hesitate. He was uh, completely um, um, interested in doing the deal. Uh, he was actually supposed to travel to Romania, at the last, but at the last minute, he changed his plans. Um, but two of his associates did travel to Romania. Um, one was with a confidential source the entire time, and the other was on his own. So we didn't know where the other one was. Um, so Manzar Alcazar, the same day that the sources were in Romania, was arrested in Spain. Um, but and we had the one associate that we could arrest immediately because he was with our source. But the other one we had to locate. And going back to the relationships and the cooperation we got from Romania, um, we were able to identify the um, other bad guy as having used a payphone in a hotel lobby in Romania. Now, this is in 2007. This is before cell phones were widely used. So we had a, a, a CCTV camera uh, see him do make a phone call from the lobby of a hotel, but he wasn't a registered guest. And then we couldn't find him anywhere. Um, so what we did was we met with our Romanian counterparts. They were, of course, working with us because they had arrested the first associate. And we said, we really need to find this guy. We can't leave him out there because he was dangerous. He was one of Alcazar's guys. So what they did was they came out with a bunch of phone books and about 10 or 15 of them each took a section of the phone book and started calling literally every hotel in Bucharest, looking, asking for the uh, associate that we were looking for. Eventually, after about an hour and a half, we were found him which hotel he was staying in, and that's how he was arrested. Alcazar was eventually uh, extradited to the Southern District of New York, where he stood trial. He was convicted. Um, the Klinghoffer family attended every day of the trial. 
Um, and he was convicted and sentenced to 30 years in prison. Wow, that's incredible. That's one of the best stories of collaboration I've heard so far. Yeah. Uh, Jen, after you left Russia, you went to Tbilisi, Georgia. Tell us about what that was like and about working with your counterparts to help them establish the first drug unit of its kind there. And also, you're going to have to tell us what's going on in this collage. Sure. So although Georgia is geographically close to Russia, working there and collaborating with them was completely different. So Georgia is working toward strengthening democracy and their rule of law, moving away from old Soviet ways and toward a Western model of policing. So they rely much more on the U.S. for assistance, and therefore we have the opportunity to truly affect the institutions with whom they work, with whom we work there. So within my first few months, I submitted a proposal for the formation of a team within their counter drug police. Um, and with the support of the ambassador, uh, the Department of State and the Georgian Ministry of Internal Affairs, they created this unit uh, within a year. And it consisted of eight officers who would work alongside DEA in country to combat drug transit. Because Georgia is part of one of the three major routes in the world for heroin trafficking. And we had some great success with the drug transit unit. In fact, Discovery Channel uh, highlighted a joint case of ours um, in 2021. You'll see some images on the screen. Um, it was a 40 kilogram seizure on the Black City Sea of uh, Black Sea City of Batumi, uh, and it was just a really great case. And it showcased how well we can really work with them um, when they dedicate an entire team. Uh, we also facilitated, while I was there, uh, the first ever alliance between Georgia, Armenia, and the Ukraine. Um, it was a drug investigation where our police counterparts followed a tractor trailer from the Iranian border all the way through Armenia, all the way through Georgia, across the Black Sea, into Ukraine, and they seized 368 kilograms of heroin in Kiev. This was right before the war began. It was in summer 2021. And it was a historical success that I really hope that we can recreate in the future. Wow. Wow. That's really incredible. Congratulations. Thanks. Sean, uh, can you speak about the largest drug prevention nonprofit mm -hmm. or volunteer group that uh, partners with DEA? Mm -hmm. And what kinds of initiati uh, initiatives, excuse me, uh, we collaborate on? Sure. Uh, so certainly the, the largest is not quite the longest partner, uh, but close. The longest partner that DEA has worked with in the community outreach space is a nonprofit called the National Family Partnership, which traces its origins just like we do in our community outreach to the kidnapping, torture, and murder of DEA Special Agent Kiki Camarena. So the National Family Partnership is just that. It's groups of parents who came together uh, around Red Ribbon and getting kids to be aware of the loss of Special Agent Camarena. And we've been working with them for a long, long time. The largest uh, footprint uh, partner that we have is an organization that's formally, formerly, formally, formally known as the Benevolent and Protective Order of Elks. And you know, mm -hmm. folks refer to them just as the Elks. And they've got uh, you know, over a million members in Elks lodges in almost every city in America. And they have worked alongside DEA for decades on making sure that local communities where they are uh, are aware of not just the local drug threats, but also what parents and caregivers can do to talk to their kids uh, and information they can give to their kids. Um, we've worked with them through the Red Ribbon Program, which happens every October, uh, which was started actually by high school kids in Calexico, California, at the high school where Special Agent Kiki Camarena had gone to school. And uh, these kids start you know, tying red ribbons around the community, supported by their teachers, uh, and that gets picked up by these parent groups spread across the United States, and the Elks adopt this issue uh, as their big charity to push out into the community. Um, we've done uh, virtual uh, digital podcasts with the Elks, which has proven incredibly helpful during the community shutdowns of COVID, mm -hmm. Uh, when one would argue, well, maybe you don't need to do community outreach because you can't, uh, because you're, you're being you know, told to, to socially distance. 
Um, however, as we've seen from the data, uh, drug use did not go away during COVID and being able to work with the Elks uh, on social media channels to get the word out and to give parents helpful tips has been incredibly, uh, incredibly productive. Um, and so, you know, they are but two examples of uh, partnerships that have helped advance the issue of awareness for drugs and a sense that uh, we must prevent substance use by youth. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Sure. George, can you talk about the international partnership that you were part of that helped apprehend international arms dealer Victor Boot in 2008? Sure. So um, we talked about the Monzer Alcazar case before, but uh, on the heels of that, um, the DEA was briefing high levels of the U.S. government uh, about how that case progressed. And at one point, was they were we were asked to investigate Victor Boot, who was known at the time as the Merchant of Death. Uh, he had uh, a long time. He was a longtime weapons supplier to drug trafficking and uh, terrorist organizations throughout the world. Um, the SOD group, again, that did the Monzer Alcazar case, also infiltrated his organization. Um, sources negotiated with members of his organization to supply uh, weapons to the FARC uh, to be used against uh, U.S. forces. Um, within months of starting the investigation, uh, Boot and his associates were indicted in the Southern District of New York. Um, and then going back to Romania, uh, we got critical evidence in the case from Romania. And what we needed to do uh, to get that evidence was, uh, and again, this speaks to the partnership and the collaboration we have from Romania, um, is a prosecutor returned from a family vacation to authorize a wire intercept that led to critical evidence in the case that was used to, to bring charges in the United States. So without the relationship that we had with the Romanians, that would never have happened. We would never have had that evidence. Um, he, B Victor Boot, was supposed to travel to Romania, and that's where we were planning on arresting him, but he actually couldn't get a visa. So we invited him to travel to Thailand uh, for a meeting, um, and at the conclusion of that meeting where he again negotiated and finalized the deal to supply a bunch of weapons to the FARC, he was arrested. Um, now, once he was arrested, uh, the Russians put extraordinary pressure on the ties to release him. Um, it took two years, but we finally got him extradited to the United States, to the Southern District of New York. Um, and he stood trial, had a jury trial, and was convicted and sentenced to 25 years in prison. Wow, that's an, another incredible story. You guys are full of them. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that, though. Yes. That's why we're here, right? Jen. Uh, you spent time working in DEA's International Training Unit. Uh, why, are, why are our training efforts important overseas? And you've shared this great collage uh, with us, so please tell us about the images we're looking at. Sure. So we all know that drug trafficking is an international problem. Um, drugs and the precursor chemicals needed to manufacture drugs come into the U.S. from multiple source countries. And as George just alluded to, uh, drug profits are the number one source of funding terrorism and organized crime across the globe. So to tackle the problem solely domestically would be missing the big picture. So at DEA, we're not only willing, but we're eager to train our foreign counterparts and share our best practices. Because if they're doing their job better, fewer drugs and chemicals are coming into the U.S., more criminal organizations are being dismantled, and the main funding source for terrorism and organized crime gets disrupted. So it's really fulfilling that we can go out and give the necessary training and equipment and assistance to our hardworking partners overseas, but it also assists with our mission at home. Um, so I was lucky enough to train uh, in many different countries, um, El Salvador, Thailand, Hungary, Mexico, South Africa. Um, so I got to see the world and also meet some really amazing foreign police officers along the way. So That's amazing. That's wow. Great. Thank you. I would love to see you in action, <laughs> doing the training. Like right now, Josh? Yes. <laughs> Not wearing the right shoes. <laughs> <laughs> but that would be really fun to see. Yep. Like, I don't know, doing some kind of maneuver in the, in the high hills. Sean, uh, collaborating with nonprofits and other federal agencies is an essential part of our preventative outreach. Can you tell us about some of these relationships and what we're looking at on the screen? So you say uh, essential. I, I would say uh, it's actually part of the DNA 
of the Drug Enforcement Administration to partner and collaborate. And that going back to the very origins of this organization and its predecessors, uh, you know, even today, DEA is only 10,000 employees strong, special agents, diversion investigators, intelligence analysts, forensic chemists, and a whole host of support staff. But when you look at the global drug situation, it's a heck of a lot bigger than that. Uh, and so it's been part of DEA from day one to work in law enforcement partnerships, to work in regulatory partnerships. Uh, and so therefore, when DEA stood up this effort to try and support drug education in the communities where our women and men are serving, it makes perfect sense to say, well, we can't go it alone. We, we must work with others who are also in this space. And that goes back to that graphic you showed us uh, earlier on in this, in this segment. So, you know, at the national level, we'll, we are dealing and, and collaborating with other federal agencies, uh, some from the, off, uh, from the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, uh, the U.S. Department of Education, uh, the Office of National Drug Control Policy, uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation, who uh, has a vested interest in making sure that folks operating out on our highways and byways are doing so uh, unencumbered by, uh, you know, being uh, hooked on, on substances. Um, so, uh, you know, again, at a federal level, uh, what can DEA do to help these other federal agencies in their efforts? What can we all work together on and have force multiplier effects? Uh, but then that, that holds tr through to the state level and down at the local level. So we have established over the decades uh, national partnerships with organizations like the Young Marines or the uh, Boys and Girls Clubs of America or, um, you know, organizations uh, that the Partnership to End Addiction. These are, these are national groups who, like DEA, have boots on the ground in communities across the United States where our local DEA offices and the local chapters or the local units of these groups can work together and that DEA brings to the table, hey folks, and I'll use an example, here in Phoenix, and I, I don't use this as a real life example, but say here in Phoenix, our number one drug threat the DEA sees is the trafficking of methamphetamine uh, and the money made from it and the violence associated uh, and the guns associated with the trafficking of methamphetamine and therefore community partners, let's work together to address the methamphetamine threat here in this community. DEA is gonna do what we do best, which is to go after the drug trafficking groups and then the community organizations and the state and local institutions of government and parents groups and faith-based organizations and teachers and schools, they can work in their areas to also, in, in, in essence, you know, bring all resources to bear uh, on these particular issues. Um, there's a slide up on the on the screen that lists just a few of the national partnerships and also makes reference to the fact that our local DEA field offices, some 220 plus offices around the United States, uh, deal with a lot of local groups uh, because there might be an instance where Buffalo, New York has a couple of organizations that are unique to Buffalo that can help address the drug issues that are happening in and around Buffalo. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is that the DEA Museum exists as a collaboration, as a partnership, that it would not exist if current and former DEA employees didn't work with other organizations to build the collection, to help develop the exhibits, to attract the tour groups that come and visit, to identify cities and venues where traveling exhibits can get hosted around the country, uh, to work with local uh, tourism organizations that, you know, it's not enough to bring an exhibit uh, to, uh, uh, you know, Charleston, West Virginia, to the State Museum, but you have to then partner with organizations in that area to bring the kids there. You know, uh, it's, it's unfortunately not as simple as if you build it, they will come. Uh, and so part of it is, is simply spreading the word that there are resources out there to help parents have conversations with their kids, to help teachers address these issues when they're in the classroom, to help business leaders uh, to talk about the importance of, of having employees that are drug free, uh, or to support them as they seek treatment and to support these employees perhaps as they're in lifelong recovery. Um, so, I mean, it's a huge opportunity, uh, but it's also a huge burden to make sure that uh, we are, as an organization, working with as many of these groups as possible 
in as productive a way as possible. Thank you, Sean. Sure. George, the apprehension of Rafael Caro Cantero was a big deal for DEA. How did it come about? And please tell us about this arrest photo. Sure. So uh, Rafael Caro Cantero, or RCQ as he's known, was um, a founding member of the Guadalajara cartel back in the 1970s. Um, and he is uh, uh, one of the people responsible for the murder of uh, the agent that Sean mentioned earlier, uh, Kiki Camarena. Um, so uh, Kiki Camarena was assigned to our office in Guadalajara and uh, RCQ at the time was a huge marijuana trafficker in Mexico. Um, in 1982, uh, Kiki was able to locate one of his grow operations that was about 200 acres and he had it destroyed. Uh, a couple years later in 1984, he located and destroyed another RCQ marijuana grow operation, which was 2,500 acres and was producing 8 billion with a B worth of dollars worth of marijuana every year. So that got uh, their attention focused on Kiki, unfortunately. So in February of 1985, uh, Kiki was going to have lunch with his wife uh, in, in uh, Guadalajara and he was kidnapped uh, on the way to that lunch. Um, he was taken to a house that RCQ owned um, and uh, tortured for over uh, 30 hours. They actually had a doctor there uh, keeping him alive so they could torture him more. Um, and what's worse is they recorded this. The bad guys recorded this. Um, a month later, uh, Kiki's uh, body was found uh, a, a, a away from the house. Um, and that really turned up the pressure on the Mexicans by DEA to find who was responsible. RCQ got wind of that and actually fled Mexico and went to Costa Rica. He was arrested about a month later in April 1985, extradited to Mexico, and was sentenced to 40 years in Mexico. Uh, he remained in jail until about 2013 when he was released, when a state court ruled that he um, uh, was improperly tried, some sort of legal technicality. So he was released in the middle of the night with no warning or notice to us. Um, and he was free until uh, July 15th of 2022, when he was captured um, in Sinaloa, Mexico, by uh, very brave Mexican Marines. Um, unfortunately, uh, his capture was bittersweet because 15 Mexican Marines uh, died in a helicopter crash as they were flying back to their base uh, due to a mechanical issue. Uh, RCQ is currently pending extradition in Mexico. We are uh, hopeful that he will be extradited at the beginning of next year so he can face justice here in the United States. Um, but this shows that, you know, DEA will never forget um, anyone um, and will always relentlessly pursue those responsible uh, for their actions. Thank you. Jen, you developed the first training programs for women police in both Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia Tell us about that experience. And here we have another collage. I like my collages. Yes, <laughs> no, I this do. is good. We love yes, it. Yes, I do. <laughs> so while, uh, while I was working in international training, I was asked to create the first course for female officers in Kabul, Afghanistan. And based on their needs, I focused on really skill building and safety. So we taught them defensive tactics, combat medicine, searching and handcuffing techniques, um, and undercover and inform informant handling as well. And it was such a rich and moving experience. And they were such a gracious group. Uh, and many of them had endured major hardships in their lives. I actually went back the following year and taught them an advanced course, hence the two pictures of, of the Afghan ladies up there. Um, and then after I transferred overseas permanently, I used that class as a basis to develop the first female training program at our drug enforcement capacity building project in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. So in 2019, I led the first class and then the third class uh, with two other wonderful female DEA agents. And unfortunately, this program um, is being discontinued, but I'm really hopeful that they can sustain their skills in-house because we had some of our participants help teach later classes. So I'm hoping. Um, and then all of these experiences with these wonderful women uh, inspired me to do uh, several leadership 
presentations to female foreign officers over the last few years. In fact, just last month, um, they invited me back to Tbilisi uh, to speak again at the annual Women in Policing Conference. And this year, there were over 300 female police officers from 20 different countries. So what a fulfilling and powerful experience that was. Yeah, yeah, that's really great. Yeah, that's right. That's great. Sean, DEA Administrator Ann Milgram began a new initiative in 2022 to collaborate with and help empower grassroots nonprofits across the country that are working in fentanyl awareness. It is called the Family Summit. Can you speak about these partnerships? Sure. Uh, I'm going to start with the old phrase that uh, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And when we look back at this country's ongoing struggles with substance use over the past decades, uh, one of the positive moments is uh, the period of time in the 1980s when family groups, parents movement, a parents movement came together to say enough is enough with both powdered cocaine and crack cocaine. We have to stop losing the next generation of Americans to that particular drug epidemic. And so flash forward to 2022, and America is losing roughly 295 Americans a day to overdose. And a good chunk of those are from synthetic opioids like fentanyl and its analogs. And uh, DEA Administrator Ann Milgram says we have got to do something more than we have been doing about that. Um, it began before the family summits, which I'll get to in a moment, with an exhibit that is currently on display at the DEA Museum uh, here in Arlington, Virginia, which is called the Faces of Fentanyl. And it was a call across the country to parents, loved ones, neighbors, aunts, uncles, grandparents, who have lost a loved one to a fentanyl overdose or a fentanyl poisoning to submit the face, the photo of their loved one. And many have also submitted the story. So uh, an exhibit that began literally almost a year ago uh, with maybe a few dozen images has today grown to over 5,000 uh, photos. And every one of those photos is a story. And many of these parents, either just as a mom and dad <clears throat> doing it in the evenings after they're done with their nine to five job, or forming a 501c3 non-for-profit foundation have begun to work in their community with helping to raise awareness of fentanyl and its dangers and how deadly it is even at a small dose, like two milligrams. And so it makes absolute perfect sense that if there's something that DEA can do to help bring these groups together and force multiply and help them be better at their work, to connect them to existing networks of prevention organizations in their community, then by all means, we need to do that. Uh, and so we started uh, shortly after that Faces of Fentanyl exhibit was developed for the DEA Museum, we began to develop a, a national summit, a gathering of, at that point, it was about 100 organizations, again, little mom and pops to really sophisticated nonprofit organizations to try and bring everybody together to make them all a little bit better at what they're doing, to give them an opportunity to tell their story, uh, to network with each other, to say, oh, I'm doing something really cool in San Diego. You in Chicago might be interested in it. Or, hey, I've got a contact in Boston, Miami. You might want to use this contact to help further your efforts locally in your community. Uh, that then grew from one initial family summit that had a national focus to a series of DEA regional summits in every one of our DEA domestic field divisions across the country back in November of 2022. So, you know, is it an opportunity? Uh, absolutely. It is an opportunity for these groups to network with each other, to share their stories, uh, to, to engage in, in training and best practices with each other, uh, but also to learn more about other DEA and federal resources that are available to them. Honestly, I truly hope, and, and DEA is doing everything in our power, to make sure that this network of parents groups not only continues to grow, but then also has sustainability so that 
it doesn't eventually break down and then 30 or 40 years from now, there's an effort to have to try and reconstitute a parents movement yet again for whatever a future drug issue might be. So uh, it's an open call to action uh, to parents and families across the country to submit photos to the Faces of Fentanyl exhibit at the DEA Museum, uh, but it's also an opportunity for more parents to get involved in their local community with other parents that are trying to save more lives, to keep other families from suffering the horrible loss of a loved one due to fentanyl or any drug of misuse, frankly. Thank you, Sean. Sure. George, how have DEA's collaborations over time helped build strong relationships internationally um, that help us in our mission? So um, as Sean was mentioning, we are in uh, a situation that, you know, certainly I've never seen in the 27 years I've been on the job with how many people are dying um, from drug poisonings. Um, and as uh, Sean me uh, mentioned, the administrator has really said that this is about saving lives. We're in this to save lives. Um, I think the only way we're going to be able to do that is through collaboration. Collaboration will save lives. Um, the DEA has a large uh, international presence. We're in 93 we have 93 offices in 69 countries. Um, and the reason for that is because most drugs are manufactured and stored outside of the United States before they're transported here. So if we were just a domestic agency, we would be reactive. We'd try and seize the drugs after they entered the country. Instead, we want to be proactive and go to the countries where the drugs are manufactured, stored, and where they transit before they get here. We think we're, we're more effective that way. Um, one of the main reasons we have foreign offices is to support U.S. prosecutions like we spoke about earlier today in the two, uh, two cases that we highlighted. Um, so the, and the only way we're successful in the foreign arena is uh, through partnerships and collaboration with our foreign counterparts. We're guests in their country. That's an important distinction. In the United States, we are the police. We can go out and arrest people. We can do surveillance. We can do our job without anybody's approval, concurrence, or support. Um, in foreign countries, we can't. We have to work with them uh, um, to have uh, a good rela relationship and to be able to do our job. Uh, what I found is these relationships turn into friendships. I'm still in touch with people that I worked with in Greece and Romania um, after all these years. Um, and I've also found that our foreign counterparts kind of go above and beyond for DEA. Um, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is we're single mission with the drug police. So most f other countries and foreign counterparts are against drugs. So they want to support us. We don't have any other mission uh, like some other uh, um, agencies do. Um, and uh, an another reason that we're successful, I think, is we really, uh, I think, try and pick the right people to go overseas. They need diplomatic and interpersonal skills to develop these relationships, maintain them and, and expand them. Um, you could be an outstanding domestic agent, but if you don't have the skills that you need overseas, you're going to fail overseas. So we really take time to, and effort to try and set these, send people that go up overseas uh, up for success. Um, uh, so a another way that we are supported by our foreign offices here domestically is, again, through the relationships and the partnerships that we have overseas, uh, we've been able to work with foreign counterparts, again, going above and beyond what they would normally do to expel certain defendants back to the United States instead of having them go through the extradition process. So expelling is one of the best ways you can support U.S. prosecutions because we immediately get the defendants back in the United States to stand trial. Um, another way that our foreign counterparts help us is not shying away from sensitive investigations, two of which we've talked about today, Manzar al Qasar and Victor Boot. I talked about the tremendous pressure that Russia put on um, Thailand not to extradite boot. Our counterparts could have said no to supporting those investigations. They didn't, I think, partly because uh, DEA is single mission and of the relationships and partnerships we formed overseas. Well, that's really interesting. That goes back to what Jen was saying about us, DEA operating outside of the political spectrum. Jen, you're a group supervisor with a local task force in Maryland. Can you explain what a task force is for viewers who may not know uh, and tell us what's happening on the ground there? Of course. So a task force utilizes personnel and resources from both DEA and our local police partners uh, in order to maximize our effectiveness. 
it's one of our best tools in DEA. And DEA's Washington Field Division, where I work, we actually have the most task forces of any DEA office. And I think that's largely because the DC, Maryland, Virginia area is massive. And as everybody knows, drug traffickers have no borders. Um, so DEA deputizes select local officers to become task force officers, TFOs. And they work alongside us agents in investigations. So in my group, I supervise TFOs from Montgomery County in Maryland and from Prince George's County in Maryland. And they bring crucial expertise. So they know the geography of their counties. They know the drug problems that they're facing there. They know the gangs, they know where the violence is occurring. Um, and you can imagine how amazing this information is on surveillance and when we conduct operations. So it's a wonderful place to work. Um, I actually worked at a task force in LA and this was circa 10 years ago or so was the whole LA, it was, it's called HIDA, wow. High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area. And that's one of the other partnerships that we have all across the US. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of those. That's fascinating. Yeah. And it sounds like it's so effective from everything that I hear about it. Yeah, it's a wonderful tool. Uh, so how are your partnerships with your colleagues helping to combat the fentanyl epidemic? Right, so fentanyl overdoses right now and fentanyl trafficking is completely dominating our work right now, uh, especially up in Maryland. Most of our cases involve investigating and seizing counterfeit fentanyl pills. They're being disguised as, um, we're seeing mostly oxy oxycodone, um, the little blue M30 pills. Uh, are, there's millions of them, um, and most of them are being sourced from Mexican cartels. So that's our big push right now in DEA, is to combat uh, fentanyl trafficking coming from these Mexican cartels. Um, and I recently just talked to a middle school and a high school in my area about the dangers of opioids and fentanyl in particular, because local students need to be aware uh, of how dangerous and deadly it is. Absolutely. Yeah. I know we get groups of students uh, almost every day at headquarters here at our museum, and we talk with every one of them about the dangers of fentanyl and fake pills. Fantastic. Now, uh, you provided us with another collage. Now, I'm having fun teasing you about that. Yep. And um, we see your task force here. So the this is the coin that I that I and designed for uh, the current task force that I'm running. And then, yeah, below is all of L.A. Uh, task forces back when I worked there. Uh, I think that was 2012. I so, should have known. It says Dodgers behind. No, um, it does say Dodgers, Dodgers behind. So see, I'm not up on my intel <laughs> or no, my surveillance. That's right. right. <laughs> yep. That was a while, a while ago. Well, thank you. Thanks. Sean. Uh, do you have one piece of advice regarding local partnerships and collaborations in drug prevention that you would offer to our viewers? Absolutely. Easy. Everybody needs to be involved. Uh, I, I think the saddest part of my job is, uh, besides meeting families who have lost a loved one to a poisoning or an overdose, is going out and, and engaging with community groups and having almost every time folks in the audience say, I had no idea that fentanyl was so deadly. I had no idea that my kids can buy illicit drugs on social media channels. I had no idea that, you know, I was gonna have a kid in my classroom come talk to me about losing a parent. Uh, and I think that points to the need for us as a nation to get further behind and involved in drug prevention education. Uh, that while DEA collaborates with our local PD and sheriff departments, with our state law enforcement colleagues, with our national federal partners here in the US, and with our foreign law enforcement counterpartners across the world, uh, we are also asking that every community organization, every family, get involved in some way, even if it's simply to educate themselves on the current drug situation, which they can do simply by visiting DEA.gov. And there's a whole host of information for a whole host of different audiences. Um, but then pledge to help spread that word. Um, and that's a partnership with your neighbors in your community, with your school, with your workplace, with colleagues in the workplace, or with your, uh, your local chamber of commerce. Um, together, it, as we help to raise awareness 
and move upstream of the problem, you know, just as DEA is moving upstream of supply, you know, internationally and domestically, uh, so too we can move upstream of uh, the availability of these substances in the local community. Thank you, Sean. Sure. George, uh, would you tell us about a few areas where DEA's partnerships uh, need to improve today and why? Yeah, so um, we've been talking a lot, obviously, about the current fentanyl uh, crisis um, that we're experiencing here in the United States. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, really, this is about saving lives. And uh, one way we're going to do that is through collaboration. Um, the drug and the fentanyl uh, crisis, but any drug problem, is too big for any country or organization to tackle on their own. Uh, we really need to partner with countries and organizations that uh, share our common values, face common threats in order to achieve our common goals. Uh, with regard to fentanyl, the two countries involved in, uh, in, in what we're seeing today are China and Mexico. A lot of the precursor chemicals that are used to make fentanyl uh, um, start from China-based organization uh, companies. Uh, they are transferred to, sent to Mexico where they're uh, made into fentanyl there. Um, we engage with counterparts in uh, Mexico and China frequently. There was just a high-level Mexican delegation here uh, in DC recently where um, they had, we had su very successful meetings on fentanyl trafficking and the associated violence that affects both of our countries. Uh, so we're hopeful that these engagements are going to translate into action so that together we can protect the communities um, and really save lives, uh, but also defeat the cartels and the precursor chemical suppliers that are responsible for the fentanyl production uh, and the hundreds of thousands of deaths throughout the world. Thank you, George. Jen, Sean, George. Uh, thank you so much for participating today. I know how busy your lives are, uh, and it means the world to us uh, that you've come and joined us today for this important program. We learned a lot about DEA's long tradition of partnerships and collaborations. Uh, be sure to check back at deamuseum.org to find more new programs celebrating DEA's 50th anniversary in the near future. And that's a wrap. <laughs>